Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the Ridgefield Library today, I would like to introduce our award-winning and pioneering global designer, Alexander Isley. My name is Laurie Gavin Bodman, and I organize the art series here, art talk series here at the library. Alexander Isley is a renowned American graphic designer and educator. His passion for typography, identity, and environmental design, and a strong sense of aesthetics have made an indelible mark in the field. Isley first gained recognition in the 1980s as a senior designer at T. Burrow Kalman's influential studio, Emma Company. He then went on to serve as the first full-time art director of the Funny and Fearless Spy Magazine. Isley founded his own firm in New York City in 1988. And in 1995, he relocated his office to Reading, Connecticut, where he works in a barn surrounded by trees. In 1993, Alex was named an inaugural member of the ID40, a survey of the country's leading design innovators. In 2014, he was awarded the profession's highest honor, the AIGA Medal, in recognition of lifetime achievement and contributions in this field. In a recent Graphic Design USA Magazine poll, Alex was named by his peers as one of the most influential designers of the past 50 years. Isley is primarily known for his work in corporate identity, packaging, and publication design, into which he has infused a strong sense of aesthetics and personality. His work is in the collection of MoMA, Smithsonian Institution, the Zurich Museum, the Poster House Museum, and the Library of Congress. Today, Ozzy will show examples and tell stories about his work, discussing how imagination and inspiration are needed to create the unexpected. He will also show work from artists who have influenced him over the years, covering a broad spectrum from Herbert Byers to that Mad Magazine. Will you please welcome Alexander Ozzy. Thank you very much, Laurie, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, I know I have a lot of competition with the weather and a popular movie next door, so um, thank you for coming. Uh, as Laurie said, I'm, I'm a designer. I study graphic design, but I think the term graphic design is a little limiting. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, so I brought an overview of my work. I moved to Ridgefield with my wife, Veronica, who's here 26 years ago. Wow. And um, we love it here. When I started my business, I wanted to d design as many different types of things as possible. Because I think it's challenging. I have a short attention span. Every professional advisor I've ever had says to, the way to fame and fortune is to Pick one thing, specialize in that, and become the expert at it. Then the world will be the path to your door. But I didn't want to be the, the world's best designer of annual reports for mid-sized Midwestern hospitals. <laughs> but there are people that have carved out that niche. Nothing against them. But uh, I, I think it's more interesting to work on a lot of different things. I think if you're in the business of communicating, you need to be out there and exposed to as many different types of situations and clients as possible. Um, what I brought along is an overview of my work and uh, some examples of some of the things that have influenced me, which means the things I've stolen from, and <laughs> tried to remix them for myself. Um, some background are all products of our, our background, and I, and I was lucky in the sense that both my parents were interested in writing and design in some capacities. My mom, she was a photographer of the uh, uh, a newspaper in Texas where she grew up. Then she went on to be a copywriter at J. Walter Thompson Advertising. A few years ago I found her portfolio, which was really fascinating just to go through and see some of these ads that she wrote for Hood Milk and Trailways. And it was just kind of fun to see this type of illustration style. Um, you know, they're just, they're just kind of, they, they, this was probably 1954, you know, and it just, it, they looked very fresh and um, very inspired just to go through her stuff and try to extricate some s stories from her because uh, she's still alive. She's in a place where 
back then, women really weren't writers very often. They, they, it was very rare to see someone in a creative position. And so I really admired her. Um, also, my father was an architect. And I was very inspired by him as well. He would bring his work home, and I would just watch him design. He had a drafting table at home, and to me, he would take a piece of paper and a pencil and a T-square and just draw this building, and then a year later, you could walk through it. And it was complete magic, where you could just use your imagination, a piece of paper and a pencil, and create something that people could experience. So I love that. And my mom was the same way. She would write something. We called her the grammar slammer because, you know, my brothers or I ended a sentence with a preposition. She would send us to her room without dessert. Um, that was like something up with which she would not put. And so, you know, so she taught me to appreciate writing. I wish I was as good at it as she is. But this is a house my dad designed. We lived in it for six months. This is North Carolina where it's very humid. But there were 40 doors, and you could open it, and the breeze would come through and keep you cold or cool. And the inside, he was very influenced by modernism. He studied under Walter Gropius, and everything was kind of clean. And, you know, I loved it. It was, it was as a first grader. Uh, we only lived in there six months because some wealthy company, a couple came and offered him a lot of money for the house, and he wanted to start his own architecture firm, so he took the cash. and. Uh, this is what they did to it, you know? It just, it just goes to show that design can break your heart, too. But uh, <laughs> I like to think of it like this. It's my memory of it, anyway. So anyway, the two of them really, you know, oh, this was their living room. They didn't ride motorcycles at all, but they just loved classic American design. So they had his and her Harley Davidsons in their living room. And never was gas in the tank, you know, just to, you know, we hung our coats on when we come to visit for Christmas. And, uh, but so just the idea of a sort of, uh, they inspired me, I guess you should say. This was a book in their library, uh, Laszlo Moholy-Nagy, some classes he taught at um, University of Chicago. And this is his work and his students' work. And basically, the point of this book, this to me was this Rosetta Stone I found in their library, where they were, he and the students made no distinction between ceramics, illustration, painting, jewelry design, product design, architecture, graphic design. Didn't matter. If you could think of a way to solve a problem using the same methodology and skills, that's how you solve it. So to me, I never grew up thinking, well, that's the borderline between illustration and product design and graphic design. It all is kind of the same thing. So I tried to be inspired by that my whole life, you know. And so, you know, when I was a kid, when I was 10 or 12, my father would put me to work making models of houses or buildings that he had designed. I got my first drafting table when I was 12, and you know he had had me detailing things that he didn't really want to do. So I kind of learned that, and to me it was kind of fun. You draw this, and then this would be built, you know, a week or two later. And I had this job when I was a kid. When I was about 14. I made this kind of business, designing and building these spectacularly unsafe plate structures for the neighborhood kids, and. Uh, you know, they paid me $100 plus materials, which in 1974 dollars, you know, was like a billion dollars today, you know. So it, it was great. This was actually for a surgeon who lived next door, and he forced me to put these little bars here because his kids kept rolling off the top. But other than that, they were very happy with it, and, you know, so that was to me, it was like, oh, design is kind of a way to solve a problem, you know. When I was in high school, I started, I promise I'll get past high school in this talk, but I, I found out for history classes, for example, I could just draw a cathedral, this is at Rennes, and rather than have to write a paper, and the teachers bought it, and it was like a great way to sort of show your knowledge of history, and it didn't last for, a couple. the teachers caught on after a couple of months, it's like, oh, he's going to do another drawing for us, but, but there was a time when I got really interested in that, so I started looking around places to go to college to study design, and being in North Carolina, they had a design school, North Carolina State University, which really, I looked around a lot. It was, it was too close to home, it was really half an hour away, but what was nice about it was that was the only school I saw that wanted to see transcripts and grades and a portfolio. So it was kind of rigorous, and they also taught architecture, landscape architecture, product design, visual design, and you didn't have to major, and that was really appealing to me. I didn't know what visual design was. In fact, I was going to be an architect. That's really what I wanted to do. They didn't, back then, graphic design wasn't a thing. You know, you didn't grow up wanting to 
design that. In fact, I didn't know what graphic design was, but I looked at this little catalog and they had these little things on the pages and I thought, all right, well, I guess that's what graphic designers do, put these little boxes on things. Or These were the class listings in the catalog. If you see, I had to take a ballpoint pen and draw horizontal rules to separate what I was supposed to study. So I thought, oh, okay, so graphic design is take important logical information and render it in such a way as to make it incomprehensible. So I didn't want to be a graphic designer because I just thought it was decoration. So, but after studying a little bit, I realized that you know, I didn't have the patience to be an architect. I didn't want to wait four years and collaborate with 60 people and have my building look totally different than what I wanted. But graphic design was, they said, here, take Helvetica and some illustration and do a little self-portrait. And I thought, well, that's, that's fun. So I started that. Uh, they didn't have a big department. After two years, I had all the teachers a couple of times. So I started looking around. It turns out the school in New York, Cooper Union, had a, a great art program. They taught design as well. So I, I moved up here. I thought I'd go to school for another year or two then moved to someplace more normal, but I ended up staying in New York because um, I loved it. It's a great place to be a graphic designer. At that time, there were probably New York, San Francisco, maybe Minneapolis, and those were the only places where you could kind of make a living in the U.S. doing that. So uh, I stayed there. I looked around. I didn't know where I was going to work, but I'd heard about this place called Emmett Company, and it was run by uh, a, a very influential designer named Tibor Kalman. Um, who actually had never really been trained as a graphic designer. He was a journalism major, but he was really smart and the best presenter I'd ever met. And he would hire young, untrained people, such as myself, and really encourage us to do good work. And because he wasn't a designer, we got a lot of agency and responsibility for our work. And then he would go sell it to the client. And that was the most amazing thing, how because so much of what we do is so subjective. and. You don't really want to hold up a design and go, well, what do you think? Because then they'll tell you, you know, it's a good yes or no. But he would teach me how to lead people along the process, because so much of what we do is a real mystery. It's taking the mystery out of it. Why did you design this? It wasn't just because I think it looked cool, but it's got to be something that solves a problem and engages people. So I, I learned a lot from him. Uh, I grew up wanting to design posters and album covers. In, in magazines, they don't do as many of those these days, but this was an album cover called the, for the music of Kurt Weill called Lost in the Stars. And we didn't really have good artwork. We went to the Kurt Weill archives, had a fuzzy picture of him. Uh, but there were different musicians that had to be kept in alphabetical order, so we have, but we also had to emphasize Marianne Faithful, Lou Reed, and Sting. So each of these little icons, this was before, you know, Apple came out and started using icons, but it was, Say, what keeps mankind alive? And that was a stake, and there was Ballad of the Soldier's Wife, was a shoe, Ballad from the Grave. We got a photographer to shoot all these kind of things. And so there's a meaning for them. It wasn't just decorative, but it means, meant something. Here's an axis I cut across a map of the world because he lived in LA, New York, and Berlin. So those are all in one kind of straight line where he lived. So there's a reason for it. So that's what I, I kind of like having a meaning behind things that, that look good as well. I didn't design this, but I love it. This is, the, this is the guidebook they use for people who work at McDonald's to show them how to put the different foods together with no words, so you can learn how to, you know, this is just this meat quality page. This was an inspiration. It's earnest, deadpan graphic design. It serves a purpose, and it's kind of honest. I mean, this thing is baked pies. That's what a big pie looks like. Um, so I, I was influenced by this. This is a restaurant in New York called Florent, a much missed kind of downtown place on Gansevoort Street. This was an ad we ran in Paper Magazine. If you were in the know, you knew where Florent was, so there was no need for an address or a phone number. So this is kind of just an ad that's just, it was in the meat district of New York, Gansevoort Street, so there's that piece of meat. It's the same piece of meat from the album cover, actually. I always think it, you can't think of an idea for design, just put a piece of meat on it, <laughs> and it, it works. That and a smiling boy, those are my two go-to <laughs> things. This was a postcard we did for Florent, and these are things I either took out of the yellow pages or drew myself. You know, it's Restaurant Florent, 69 Gansworth Street, New York, little gun, you know, telephone, the hours are open, soon to be open 24 hours, just on cheap shirt cardboard, printed one color. This was a time in the 80s where things were slick, multicolored real estate brochures, and instead we wanted to do something that was just plain. This is a poster for the AIGA, American Institute of Graphic Arts. 
and the assignment was to do something for their humor show competition. So I thought it'd be really fun to do a designer's nightmare poster, like totally mistrimmed, the colors are wrong. Back in the days, you would put FPO, four position only. It's supposed to be stripped out before it's printed. These are all things that actually happened to me, sort of mistakes. On the back, there's this big hair that printed on it. That happened to me too. So it's just basically stuff that had happened to me. It's great when you can design something for a very targeted audience because they get all the jokes. You couldn't send this out to the world at large. Half the jokes would be lost. We also did, the nice thing about Tibor, he would do these kind of promotional gifts to send out just for fun. And this is a ruler that's got, um, it's, on the front was inches and centimeters, but on the back was just different types of measurements to, that were used throughout history. For example, wire gauges are here. There's barley corns, which used to be to measure footwear. USDA, short, medium, and long grain rice. There's <laughs> hairlines and hair breadths, which are different. There's hands for measuring horses. There's just a hair, which is the hair taken from my arm. And so it was all kinds of a microwave, one thin dime. So it's all stuff that's real units of measurement, but it kind of, you want it to look kind of cool too. And like I said, that's one of my hidden agendas, and not so hidden agenda to, to make something that you hope looks good, but then the careful reader is rewarded. So there, it kind of imparts information. Um, this is a template I did for my dad. He said, you know, I want a brochure, or in his southern accent, he was like, I want a brochure. And I said, well, you don't need a brochure, it's obsolete as soon as it's printed. You really want something you can hand out to people, they will remember your company, know how to get in touch with you. So it spells out Isley Architects, which is the name of his firm, and he said, it's just, it's made from the company Barrel Rapid Design, which makes architectural templates. And the idea was, he said, you know, the hardest thing about designing a building or someone's house is the bathroom. People are so persnickety about their bathroom. I said, why don't you give a template with a toilet and a tub and a sink on it, let them design their own damn bathroom. And he's like, that's brilliant. So that's where this idea came from. And it was really a martini glass because he liked martinis. But it was fun to go to his office and actually pre-computer use, the designers were actually using this to sort of create shapes. So this kind of just goes to show this costs less to print than a brochure would have. You can sometimes, people think they know what they want when they come to you. You said, you know, do you really need to design this book? Why don't you? For the same amount, invite the 50 people you wanted to get this to a party, and it's going to cost you less money, and they'll remember you more. And so there's different ways to solve a problem, and this was one of them. This is a promotional gift for his building. Uh, this is crumpled up. This is the press box at Duke University football stadium, which was one of his uh, buildings, and it just was sent out. Him and company had done these paperweights before, so this is one um, which they can buy it moment now. It's still it's, they still in production. 35 years later. Uh, we also did film w w work, album covers for Talking Heads, film titles. There's this movie called True Stories. I don't know if you've seen it. It was written by David Byrne based on stories that he had read in the National Enquirer. So we designed an identity for that. And these were some of my inspirations. Weekly World News, National Enquirer, and this is an ad that ran about the movie. And it was really hard to design things where, you know, why is this flesh left? Why is this centered? You know, these are the typefaces that they use, but there's this kind of earnest goofiness that was kind of the inspiration for these kind of, uh, the, the ad. We also did the titles for the movie. Back in the day, this was pre-digital, this is a long time ago, where you'd have to really look at the footage and figure out where your type was going to go and then film it on a machine called an Oxberry and then superimpose it. So it was really kind of, you learned a lot of technical stuff. We also created gifts for ourselves, like I mentioned. This was a dictionary. We just, we took it, we bought dictionaries, cut the covers off, and changed it to a book of words from Inman Company. And because we felt guilty here, it says, as told to Merriam Webster at the bottom. <laughs> and then you open it up. And I, I really love the illustration of inside old dictionaries. So I wanted to look like 50s kids pajamas on the end paper. So there was just taking illustrations from inside the dictionary, but we, we came up with our own you know captions for each of them. So there was just kind of so it's funny, you know, and it was kind of I mean so much design takes itself so seriously, but I, I think that's something that Tibor had a really good sense of humor and we really had sort of a, a, a an outsider's view since he didn't study design. He was kind of resentful of slickness. So. He wanted to appeal to people that way. So I, le I learned a lot from him. I was there for two, two and a half years. It was a great, great first position, but I really believe I was given a lot of responsibility because six or eight months after I started, the senior designer quit. So I was the senior designer right out of school, and I learned a lot. And 
I really believe that it's important to put yourself in your in where you're over your head and you don't know what's going on because before you know it, it starts to happen and you learn. My next job was at Spy Magazine. I'd always wanted to work at a publication. Spy was a, a magazine that was independently published and our competition was magazines that were put out big, big publishing houses. So we had no money. <clears throat> but these are some of the things that inspired me. Old Sears and Montgomery Ward catalogs with little illustrations or I always liked the way road maps and Yellow Pages looked from a distance, it didn't look like much, but when you get closer, you learn something. And this sort of inspired my layouts through the pages. This is another thing I love, a Swiss Air poster to talk about what happens on the plane. And, uh, you know, it, it does, it's not like a classic poster where it's a big word and image, but it's this elaborate te tapestry where it talks about everything from how the engine works to where the routes are to the cheese tray and what wines they serve on it, how the seating works, how the seats require. So it's kind of, you know, from a distance it doesn't look like much, but if you drill into it, there's all this information that's layered together. So I, when the editors, you know, this magazine hadn't come out yet, they, the prototype was being designed by another firm. They asked me what I wanted to do, and I sort of showed them pictures of Montgomery Ward catalogs and DC-7 planes. And what I really didn't want to do was what I consider lazy magazine design, where you do a nice tight thing on one page, then you commission a photo photograph or an illustration on the other, and that's your layout. To me, it's more interesting to get things to weave together so the stories hold together. This is the first thing I designed for them. Up to that point, I'd just been designing, talking about Montgomery Ward catalogs and yellow pages. We had this story called Too Rich and Too Thin. Spy had super no money. So this was just a story about how society women in New York, this was the late eight, mid 80s at the time, were too skinny, they had too much money. So it was a black and white story, and we just had paparazzi shots at the bottom. So it just kind of, you know, this is the first time I remember the editor standing behind me, I sort of laid this out. I thought it'd be helpful to have details of their necks so you could see the skinny part. And this is because this isn't reckless yellow journalism. We had a scientific explanation about how these are not just made up stories. There's this weight versus wealth quotient based on the height, dress size, and um, our publisher was a math major, so he helped with this. So there was a danger zone. You were up there in the beginning. So part of this was just because it's funny, but also it's a kind of commentary on how you, if you're designing for Newsweek or Time, you can take almost any type of information and put it in a tabular or chart form to make your argument, and it can be the most dumb unresearched thing you could think of, but once you put it like this, it looks like you know what you're talking about. So it was kind of a double layer commentary on this. This is a story about Canadians among us, how Canadians are coming into our country, stealing up our women, stealing our real estate, taking our jobs. You know, we think about it. Lauren Michaels, Canadian, people that own Battery Park City, you know, magician Doug Henning, Canadian, of course. Um, Brooks Brothers, owned by Canadians. So this was kind of this muckraking spy story, all printed in two colors. This is a story about little men, how little men are coming and stealing our jobs, taking up our real estate, stealing our women. You know, so we had, again, no budget. These are kind of little tiny photographs we had put together. Um, you know, Sylvester Stallone, Michael J. Fox, Paul Simon, normal size man, just for uh, comparison's sake. So it was a fun to work on this thing, you know. When an editor gives you a headline like this, you know, it's just really uh, this is a story about how the publishing house would take a story about Teddy Kennedy's uh, mine in Chappaquiddick. That's me throwing the bucket of water. Um, Chappaquiddick, this is cut with a razor blade because we had no money again. Um, and a detail of his uh, Delta 88 car he was driving. They also, there was this guy in New York, this real estate developer, that was the bete noir of spy. And anyone who lived in New York in the 80s, knew what Charleston this guy was. Um, and so we make fun of him in every issue. In fact, that's where he was called short fingered Bulgarian, our editors, uh, great these things. So there's a little chart about his hands, and this is a little chart about how you can do Trumpian things. And this is a long time ago. We were, April Fools, we thought we would do a nice issue. So it would be uh, two covers. So there would be Donald Trump, this was my assistant at the time, you know. You bend over, and then the cover would open, and the tail would come out. <laughs> that was the idea, but the ad sales people said, double covers, that's great, we'll sell an ad there. I was like, well, there goes that idea, thanks a lot. We did something else, so here's our cover for the April Fools. The nice issue, Donald Trump, the heck of a guy. And then you open the cover, and he goes splatting down the barcodes. 
explodes. So it was kind of, you know, it was a lot of fun to sort of do that. And the inspiration for my in this magazine was, was Mad, which I loved when I was a kid. You know, there's me reading my Mad and uh, all the marginalia, little details that were hidden. It was very important to me. So I basically, we had a section called the fine print, where it was tiny little type. These are restaurant reviews taken from what the uh, New York City Department of Sanitation talked about rat feces and you know in each restaurant. So it's very tiny. We created our own little drawings that we would put into there. This is all computer, so pre-computer, so you had to really draw everything by hand. Or when there was a little silhouetted head, we would you'd have to paint it and correct it like this. So there's a lot of handwork involved with this, which I think is a really important skill to have. I can't take credit for inventing this. I stole this look from Modern Screen Magazine, you know, from the 40s and the 50s. But it works, especially if you, all of the imagery you have, since we had no money and people wouldn't, after the magazine came out, people wouldn't give us any photos because then we were going to make fun of them. So you had to work with what you've got. This is the spy guide to postmodern and everything. So I really was getting into sort of com complex typographic arrangements might be overwhelming at the beginning, but once you start reading it and pull the thread on it, you can sort of figure out how things work. My inspiration from that was when I first was in college, I was working at an ad agency just doing pay stuff uh, for mock-ups. I didn't have the experience or talent to really do the final artwork, but I learned a lot. This was a place called McKinney and Silver in North Carolina, an award-winning firm. And what I learned there was how the copywriters and the art directors would work together to craft the text Perfectly, They had a style that was called fake rag, where every third or fourth line was actually justified. I mean, it looks just, you wouldn't notice it, but there's a real craft that's involved with writing and cutting and getting everything. The type was cut apart by hand to get it perfectly. If something made an ugly rag, they would fix it, but it also had to be written very poetically. And I love that, sort of the discipline. If you look at old magazines, like Life from the 50s, Every caption is exactly the same number of lines and they all square up, which is really hard to do because you have to write it and the editors wouldn't care. They knew that was the way things are done. It's kind of a lost art, but I really love the idea of getting things to sort of fit perfectly, you know? So that was kind of what I tried. You spent a lot of time, you know, for something that most people don't even notice, but to get the, the type to fit with crap. And, and most of our covers would start like a sketch, you know? We wanted to do a story called Rat City, how rats are all over New York. Here's the idea, we can have rats crawling up a model's leg. We got Carol Alt to pose with the model, with these rats. She was free, the rats cost $300. We had a rat wrangler, and the rats would run off the set, and the photographer's boys would push them back on there. So we shot, and we, this was the shot, no retouching whatsoever. We got a perfect shot for that, and, you know, got everything to sort of fit together. We didn't really have circulation directors who said you can't put your cover lines at the bottom, no one's going to look at that. But uh, um. So anyway, I was there in a year and a half. We also did invitations. This is the opening for the opera Nixon in China, where Nixon comes popping out. So it was just uh, non-magazine things, too. And I, I kind of missed doing the work that was non-magazine related, even though I think designing magazines is great, and I love it. Um, I'd always wanted to have my own firm, and like I said, I believe in putting yourself in a position where you're in over your head and terrified, particularly at a young age, but I think throughout your life you should do that. So I've been saving up, and I started my own company, um, and I didn't have any clients. I was trying to think about what I want to call it, you know, like something I wouldn't get sick of. I still like that one. I've got the URL for that. Uh, you know, that was being honest, but I ended up naming after something I could remember and I didn't think I would get sick of in six months. Um, and so that's what, how I promote myself now. Alexander Isley, Inc. designer, I thought it was important to try to get my name out there rather than have sort of an ambiguous name. And I tell clients we do identity development, communication design, and to describe it a little bit more specifically, I'll say we work with companies and organizations to develop their identities and convey their mission and spirit to the public. So I'm not making stuff up, I'm taking what's good and important and valuable to a client and, and uh, helping their audience understand better what they do. So I only work with companies that I believe in because it makes it easier to do the work. And we don't have a really focus. I like to do a lot of different things. For some of our clients, we'll just do one of these. But I think I have the most fun and most success when we can be involved in a lot of different things at the same time. And my sort of uh, not so hidden agenda is to work with organizations 
do a lot of work with schools, a lot of work with libraries, uh, educational um, organizations that really, cultural, that have uh, a passion for what they do and there's a purpose. My hidden agenda, not so hidden agenda, I guess, is to encourage action. It's not enough if someone looks at something, but I want them to come to the exhibit, or I want them to go to the website, or I want them to write a check, or whatever we're trying to get them to do. It's hard enough to make something just look pretty, which is tough, but to get it to do something or to communicate a message, to me, that's the real challenge, and, and that's what I enjoy doing. Um, I started a business in New York down Lower Broadway and was there for a few years. Um, and, and I loved it, except I kind of was kind of tired of living in New York, and I wanted to, uh, I really wanted to work in a barn. I couldn't find a barn on Lower Broadway. I looked, um, and the trees, same kind of problem. But finally we came around and we found this barn in the Georgetown section of Reading, which is where we work now, and it was, it was perfect. So uh, one, one weekend in 1995, my wife and I had made a life makeover. We moved to Richfield, and at the same time moved our business to Georgetown and sat there on a bunch of boxes the first night looking at each other like, well, what did we just do? We're going to go out of business in 45 minutes. But, you know, we got busier, so that, that was good. So we're still there. Uh, what, the very first thing I designed when I started my business in New York was I, I wanted to come up with some kind of little symbol for myself, and um, I totally stole this from the New Haven Railroad. <laughs> Herbert Matter designed this uh, in, I think, late 40s, early 50s, and they still use it today. Um, I love it, uh, just seeing this, I've read the stories about the creation of this, and it's rare, rare for livery to be that old and still used in daily. The purpose is, I, I read articles about the designer, about how they agonized whether or not to put a serif at the bottom of this in. They thought it was much better and had more movement to do this. Every once in a while you'll treat, see a train go by and someone's painted a serif on it. So, <laughs> I just want to write a note to somebody. But, um, so that's where that came from. One of the very first things I designed was for this music production company called Edge Communications. And uh, I thought it'd be fun to do with Edge, and then after I made the first presentation, they got bought by somebody else. So I was disappointed that, that never happened. But I kept it taped up over my desk, and then about a year later, I got this call from this guy, Bobby Flay, that wanted to do this restaurant called Macy Grill. And they were amazed at how quickly I came up with the solution. In fact, this drawing was made while they were on the phone. You know, I thought, you know, Mesa, tabletop, flat top mountain, and that's how that came to be, which is still used today. Um, and, you know, it's just to kind of show that sometimes an idea will be appropriate or even more so down the road. Uh, so we did matchbooks for them, restroom signs, kind of continuing that theme, uh, opening announcements. A lot of times, I mean, who, it's a boring announcement saying we're open for business, so I said, well, give me four recipes that you really like that you weren't able to work into your menu. So we sent out this series of four postcards that had four of his recipes at the beginning. And then we went on to design everything from products, cookbooks, oh, I didn't design this, but, so that was the Bobby Clay story, but I've always loved Happy Boy Margarine. In New York, they had this brand, which is just, you know, why is he on there? Why is that boy on there? And like I said, if you can't think of an idea, we were approached by the Brooklyn Academy of Music to do a poster for the New Music America Festival, um, which is this boy, because it was electric chainsaws and drills and weird kind of new music that we would show up, so we thought, read well, so why don't we just do a poster and it was designed so it could be gang four up on the street, that's how young we were back then, and uh, you know, it really, so you'd see these posted all over New York, which was a lot of fun. Uh, we also used the mask as a, a ceremony, uh, opening ceremony event. On the back, it's got text that tells you how to use it, because I believe in having helpful information. <laughs> Don't operate heavy machinery while wearing this mask. You know, just legal disclaimers are really important. Um, and it was just, just as Laurie Anderson took a picture, a picture of the, the smiling voice, he became the mascot and the symbol for new music. You know, it's just because to show, if you pick up a, pick a symbol, it's, in a way it's like a name or a logo, what it is, is semi-important, but how you use it in a consistent way, that's when it starts to become a brand. My test of a good identity for companies, if you can put your thumb over the logo and still know where the material is coming from through editorial tone of voice and visuals, that's an identity. So this became the identity for that. Here's a few other projects I'll just go through uh, quickly because I want to be respectful of your time. Armani Jeans came to us. We worked with the architects and Naomi left. They wanted a new line of products that were lower end, jeans and t-shirts for Armani. 
and they wanted things to be natural, and we designed these stainless steel, they had this in, incomprehensible fit and wash nomenclature that we had to stick with, so we thought we would do a chart inside the stores showing people what the different washes and fits are to help them select what they're going to get. We had special custom recycled paper made back in the day when that wasn't done very often, using a very high recycled content. Um, you know, packaging using ropes from like clotheslines for the handles, really natural. I always loved the way fertilizer bags looked with the stitching along the top. So that's the way the shopping bags were made. So that really kind of had natural materials. Um, closer to home here, Canico Hills, Stone Barn Center for the Food and Agriculture. If you've never been there, it's a wonderful teaching facility and then a farm and a restaurant, Blue Hill. It used to be the Rockefeller family's horse barn. We met with them to go through how to promote and market themselves and create their identity. Since the food changes all the time, both in the fields and on the restaurant, why do you need a single logo? So we created consistent colors and type, but different imagery um, to, to reflect what the barn is. We created signage using recycled and reclaimed materials, locally quarried stone um, for the signs. We copied the uh, cow off the top of the barn. We wrote and designed the structures talking about what happens here at the farm. So it's really a comprehensive program. For years, we did all the stuff for them, uh, anything to do with identity and communication, um, quarterly brochures, opening posters, these special paper we had made with seeds from their vegetables so that after you get a note card, you can tear it up, plant it in the ground, and grow their uh, radishes or whatever it was. Stickers, flashcards for age-appropriate education uh, for kids, website. Um, so we still work with them from time to time. It's a wonderful place if you never have a chance to go there. This is a book we did for a woman named Kate Asher who used to work for the Port Authority. She spent five years collecting these 15 binders worth of infra infrastructure information about New York City. And my inspiration was the World Geographic Atlas that Herbert Meyer designed. I've got a copy back there you can look at, which was this wonderful atlas from 1952 that talked about everything from evolution to how Pangaea ended up being the continents to um, how volcanoes work to the difference between uh, nimbulo cumulus and alto stratus clouds. So it really is this comprehensive book. So inspired by that, we went through and actually designed every page in the book before it was written, which is the backwards way of usually designing a book. And Kate and her assistant wrote it. And we had a team of 12 illustrators using a color palette and the line widths that we had specified. And this book is great. It's all about the infrastructure of New York, how the subway cars work, how ridership uh, changes hour to hour, how the Fresh Kills landfill works, how cell towers work, how high-rise sewage works, what trees they, that grow in New York with the pollution, and even this is the uh, avenue of death, the most dangerous intersection in New York City, which is in Queens, and how different traffic calming measures can be used to cut down on the number of pedestrian fatalities. So it's a great, it was a great book. We had to do it really quickly. But I love stuff like that. Speaking of infrastructure, this is the uh, signage for the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. 16 foot tall letters that had to be engineered to withstand gale force winds and also keep pigeons out. So there's screening for that. Inside, there's a poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay encircling the waiting room. We were very tired, very merry. We'd gone back and forth all night on the ferry, illuminated. Um, I couldn't take a picture inside because the police chased me out, but so it's a little fuzzy. And we also did videos that um, appear above the slips. The current project we're working with is in Amherst, Massachusetts, the Yiddish Book Center, a wonderful place founded by Aaron Lansky when he was a graduate student at Columbia. And he, he realized that people, his parents and grandparents' age, um, their Yiddish books were being discarded. And he made it his mission to collect them and create a repository for them. And he got a MacArthur grant to help fund him. Um, and it's been wildly successful. It's a beautiful campus. Uh, Steven Spielberg uh, gave a big grant to build this wonderful building. And they had an identity that they'd outgrown. Right now, it's more of a cultural center. It's not just the building. It's not just the book center. So we talked about, well, how can we create 
an idea for um, what this should be. In, in our research and discussions with them, the idea of the little baby goat kept coming up in, liter in Yiddish literature and in Yiddish art. And we thought that might be uh, a good thing to base the identity on um, for all these reasons and, and even more. And so we looked through their archives. I mean, the first book I pulled off the shelf had an illustration by Mark Chagall in it, for example, of the goat. And so, you know, there's these wonderful, <laughs> we looked at different artists. We commissioned an artist from Australia to create this goat for us. And how do you make a logo out of that? We want, they wanted to have the word Yiddish as part of it, so that's a sketch. I found this book that was written and illustrated by Ella Zitsky. And uh, yeah, it's, this is a reprint. And uh, I love the lettering that was in the frontispiece of this book. So we took that, created letter forms where they didn't exist before in consultation with our, our typographer named Yanko, who lives in Brooklyn, who's, I, I can't read this stuff, so it makes it very difficult to design. For whatever it's worth, sir, what's interesting about it is, is it they, wrong? <laughs> they took the print from the Torah. This is actual Torah print, and that makes it very authentic, very ancient, very biblical. Yeah, I meant to do that. Thank you. It's good to know. I thought you were going to say, that spelled Yiddish wrong or something. No, you did, but it's okay. It's when you had been fine. Thanks. So this is the uh, presentation we made to the directors and, and people who, who uh, you know, showing how, with a very limited color palette, you can make it work. If you've never been up there, it's only a couple of hours away. It's a wonderful place. You know, we created all the publication work for them, designed posters. They have a festival called Yitzhak every year. It's a classical music festival. It's the 12th year that it's happened now, and it's really uh, quite quite popular. I stole the look from the Woodstock poster for those of you who remember a guitar with a bird on it. So our note is on the clarinet. Signage for around the campus. We designed a magazine called Pock and Traeger, roughly translated to Traveling Peddler, Book Peddler, and they've great, just great, wonderful things in their archive. Early. 20th century Eastern European illustration. Um, so we, for the last 11 years, have designed this uh, publication that comes out, their newsletter, well, uh, digital publications. They have a podcast called The Schmooze. And so it's really, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. This is for people, a lot of people who, it's become a real resurgence among people in their 20s to, to go to the book center and learn Yiddish. So it's a website for younger Yiddish speakers. Uh, this is a poster we did for the National Endowment for the Arts explaining to school children, K to 18, which is too wide a net to do anything, but that was the assignment from the NEA and the Smithsonian. Talk about what is design. That's an impossible thing to talk about too. So rather than just show an object, I thought it would be nice to show that design is a process. And how is this? telephone design. It used to look like this. The Bell 500 series telephone came about through thinking, focus group, prototyping. You ended up with this today when this came out. Phones look like this. So to get people thinking about design as a process is not like a sole genius sitting in a room, but it's a team effort. It's collaborative. Um, you know, I get three page letters from the Smithsonian saying, everybody knows a poster has to read from top to bottom. Yours is from bottom to top. So we'd have to deal with that. But we got it through. I think the next case study should have been how you design a poster. Uh, more close to home, this is in Bridgeport. There's a company called Color Blends. They're one of the country's largest tulip bulb importers. Uh, it's a Dutch family that's been in the US for generations. They needed us to help them with their marketing material. This was their older logo. We updated to look like a, inspired by a stencil on tulip bulb crates make it more colorful. We designed their catalog for them. We designed their website, packaging. You know, so it's a really, they sell all, all, all of the countries that where, you, where you can grow tulips. A series of posters, be a big, beautiful blend believer. These are things that are sent out to commercial customers. A lot of municipalities, golf courses, buy their bulbs. Their thing is they pre-mix them. So you have a pre-mixed arrangement of tulips. They come up at the prescribed time. So we've done a series of posters for them over the years. I've got some posters in the back. If, when you leave, if anybody wants a poster, help yourself. 
I like this one, it's my favorite, he's a bulb, the bulb he's dreaming about what he's going to be when he grows up. It says, plant color blends this fall because everyone forgets you're supposed to plant them in October, November, uh, for them to come up this time of year. We've done billboards around the country, uh, animated ads, print ads, um, some of these animate. And right now in Bridgeport they have a thing called the House in Spring Garden. Starting today through next weekend is when all the tulips are coming up. So I recommend if you go, if you're interested in this, they, they have a, a Dutch uh, horticulture that comes over every year and plants different uh, hundreds of varieties of tulips. They also have space in this building that they bought that they give out uh, free space to six different artists every year, artists and residents. So they're really good civic uh, participants in, in the Bridgeport scene. So if you have some time next weekend or during this week, I would suggest going by there um, because it's really magnificent what they do. So this is kind of just, we're hired to do this stuff on the end, but in order to get there, you really need to do your research as a designer to think about who your audience is, what misconceptions they might have, how can design help tell a story, and then, only then, can you really figure out what something should look like. Some, the way something looks is the last thing I like to figure out. Shouldn't be the first thing, because my first idea is usually terrible, but second and third usually can a little bit closer. This is a project that ended just, happened just during COVID, so I didn't really see this until last week. This is a library at North Carolina State University. They're doing a new three-floor installation for a learning center, the video visualization studio, a circular studio. And a lot of times, I don't have a specific assignment when I'm hired. In this case, they just said, we want you to be involved somehow. I've, listen, I've, worked, I've waited 35 years to be able to hear that, but it's, happen, it's starting to happen. We want to be involved, but we don't know exactly what we want. So, you know, we said, well, you've got this space, you've got this big curved wall, why don't we do a mural, the history of data visualization? Since this is a library, can we talk about the history of uh, amassing, storing, and disseminating information over the years? So we started doing a lot of research, everything from cuneiform tablets to Rosetta Stones to um, you know, Balinese map, uh, maps using shells and sticks to plaques that were sent into space, musical notation, dance notation, and really doing a timeline. You can see not much happened for several hundred years, and in the last hundred years or so, data information has become more well known. And we created this idea where how can we take this material and put it on a structure that we designed that's got sort of angles. The colors were inspired by a, a site-specific installation that's in the library from when I was a student there. So we took the color palette and made it so that when you walk around this circle, different things start to happen and you see the colors change. So we created all this material, created the artwork, did sort of our, our history of data and put it together, um, showed lots of videos, which is not, it's not running right now, but uh, it, lots of testing. And then they finally, you know, we put it together, there's sheets of formed steel that go around the building and this is what it looks like now. So, like I said, I just saw it for the first time last week because it happened during COVID, uh, the installation that couldn't go down there. But it's fine, you walk around it and different kind of patterns emerge and it starts to tell a little bit of the story. And this last thing I'll show is something that is really close to my heart. There was the 9-11 Memorial in Jersey City. It was designed by Frederick Schwartz. Um, and the idea, his award-winning idea was that these two parallel panels uh, are in Jersey City. And when you stand here, the edges take up the same skyline silhouette as the Twin Towers did. And we wanted the inscriptions of 814 people from New Jersey who perished to be as large or larger than any public inscription that we have been able to find uh, so far. And all the names are arranged. In some cases, family members wanted their family members or friends to be together. And this was all done by hand because you also want the same amount of space between each word. You don't want to split someone's name uh, in, in the middle of, of an individual name. Um, so it was a real puzzle, and we met with the families. You know, obviously, as you can imagine, very emotional um, exercise. To, and you want to get it perfect. You know, this is going to be around for a while. Um, this was etched in Ohio for some reason. Almost any type of metal etching happens in Ohio. Um, 
and we ran lots of tests, and this is kind of the way that it's put up. Um, and the names run on both sides of it, and something that none of us counted on during sunrise and sunset at a certain time, you get sort of this halo effect that happens uh, in the building. It's really quite moving, and, um, uh, and we designed it so it's deep enough that you can do rubbings of your family members or friends. Um, anyway, so that's kind of, uh, my, uh, I'm, I'm out of time, I'm happy to answer any questions. My name's on the door, but it's not just me. It's very important that I, I work with a series of designers. I lead the projects, but I work with designers that I trust, and a lot of the credit for this stuff goes to them. Um, and uh, I'm really grateful to be able to, to work with uh, people from the area in, in doing these projects. Um, I try to in, infuse some of my southern history by frying turkeys occasionally. <laughs> but, uh, and I'll always get takers. Um, but that's, uh, that's it. And uh, thank you for your time. I said I'm happy to answer any questions. There's posters in the back if anyone wants them. Also some books that we've designed uh, just to, to look at if you want to, um, including that geographic atlas. Um, if you're interested. But if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes? Business model. How do you charge for the creativity to do the research and, and all the learning up front? Do you do by hour and look at a project or do you do by project? It's, it's this weird alchemy. How do you charge for something was the question. Because I, I don't charge by the hour because if you charge by the hour, you get penalized for being good and fast. And if you go over, they're not going to pay you anyway. So you lose, lose. So we just we figure out a, a fee. And I'm very detailed in my proposal what we're going to do what the steps are involved, but it's, we, it's, it's a combination of how long, we keep, I keep records of how long similar projects have taken, so that helps inform it a little bit. So how long do I think it's gonna take me to do, what is this kind of worth in the open market? Because depending on the client, if it's a not-for-profit versus a corporation, even though it's a similar assignment, you charge more for that. And it's a little bit of a risk. I mean, if it goes over, I mean, you know, you win some, you lose some. I mean, I've designed, uh, 40 or 50 books, and I've lost money on every single one, the amount of time that goes into it, because to me, books are, are, are close to my heart, and I don't want to just bang it out, because this is close to something almost almost permanent as I can do, so I, you know, that's my own fault, I know, going in, what's going to be the problem, but other projects can go a little bit more smoothly, but, you know, at the end of every project, you know, you win some, you lose some, but you try to make a little bit of profit. So with this client, this is, we just want to be around. I'll say, here's what I think you can do. I think you need some wayfinding to help people through the project, but I also think you need an environmental graphics component, which could be a mural, could be video screens, could be something else. Our fee to develop this is X amount, and we'll give you six concepts. And then, that's phase one. Phase two, once you pick them, this is the range. So at least they have an idea. Sometimes if someone's coming in and you you know, and that's one thing, it's a school or an organization that's used to hiring designers. You know, the people that are, you have to be careful of have never done it before, like the sole entrepreneur, those are the ones that are it's very difficult because A, they may have not have done it before, B, every dollar is coming out of their pocket, so they put it through a weird filter, like I can buy a car or I can hire you. So, but if it's a company, they've got a budget, so it's much easier. Sometimes you can say, what's your budget? And I can tell you what you can get for that. But usually it's more, you, you say, it's kind of, you know, if someone really hasn't done it before, I'll say, okay, this is a $20,000 project, or this is a $50,000, or this is $5,000. Are we talking about what you've put aside before I even put together a proposal? Because that takes a day or two, sure. You know, just to see if that's kind of in the ballpark. And then, you know, so, but definitely there's a little bit of jockeying back and forth, and, you know, you try to say, it's like, listen, you can always, the thing about graphic design is, now, you can always get it cheaper, you know, it's people that can, you know, you can always find someone who knows Photoshop or something like that. But then you can buy me a nice Steinway piano. That's the, that's the toughest part, you know, because you know, but we try to make sure that you work efficiently afterwards. But, and, and, sure. All right, thank you all. Bravo. Thanks, Alex.